Good morning, Argyle. How about them Jaguars? I may never be able to say it again, so let me say it now. The Jags are undefeated. Now, it didn't count. That's too bad, <laughs> but we'll take it. Here's some upcoming dates you don't want to miss. Christmas in August is next Sunday right after church, 1145. You've always dreamed of singing on the Christmas tree, and here's your chance. So come next week and hear the music. We'll get you ready to participate in the 29th annual Argyle Outdoor Singing Christmas Tree. We're excited about it. The Argyle Summit, Sunday night, August 27th, 530. Who's the summit for? Everyone who loves Argyle. If you love Argyle, you need to sign up and be there. Great food from Mission Barbecue. Great music by the Mike Maple Band. Fun and prizes. Be encouraged and equipped by Bob Bumgarner. It's going to be an awesome night. It's free, but you need to register in advance so we can make sure we have food for you. We continue today in our study of the New Testament book, Thessalonians. The title of our series is Are You Ready? This is part 15. Our scripture today is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, so you can follow along in your Bible let me remind you that we make a study guide to go along with the message every week. The study guide is available on our website, argyle.church. You can download it for free. It ought to be 20 bucks, but, <laughs> but we've made it free to you. Verse 14, and we exhort you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle, comfort the discouraged, help the weak, be patient with everyone. See to it that no one repays evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good for one another and for all. So I thought we'd review a little bit what we talked about last week because I got this feeling you don't listen. But I know you do. I know you do. We talked about what it means uh, to be a healthy church. In other words, what makes a healthy church? church and that tells us then that some churches are not healthy that some churches may be spiritually sick and none of us want that so are there steps that we can take to keep our churches from becoming spiritually sick can an unhealthy church change and become healthy last week we saw three things that make a church healthy. Number one, a healthy church is gospel-centric. That means that the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, is at the center of everything we do. The gospel is the good news that Jesus came to earth to be our Savior. The gospel is the good news that Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sin. The gospel is the good news that Jesus rose again on the third day, victorious over sin and death. And so because of that, we can repent of our sin and we can accept God's free gift of grace through faith in Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. A healthy church is gospel-centric. A healthy church is outward-focused. That means that we should not be inward focused as a church that we realize that church is not about me and my preferences you know it's very difficult for us to see selfishness in ourself others see it but we don't selfishness has a way of disguising itself you see we don't think we're selfish no we think we're just standing for what's right and by the way what's right is what I believe but an inward-focused church will always be an unhealthy church. A healthy church is gospel-centric. A healthy church is outward-focused. A healthy church is changed inside out. See, an unhealthy church will always put an overemphasis on appearance. They teach that what is most important is that we appear to be spiritual that you do religious stuff 
and that you use religious words and you say religious things. But what we really need is real life change through Jesus from the inside out. What we really need is to be changed inside out. The New Testament church that we're focused on during this series is the church that Paul founded in Thessalonica. From Paul's description of this church, we can tell that the Thessalonian church was a healthy church. The Apostle Paul said this to the Thessalonians in verse 11. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up as you are already doing. Isn't it great to be told that you're already doing the right thing? You're doing the right stuff. And what you need to do is just keep on doing it. In other words, a healthy church will encourage each other and will build each other up. See, it's our vision at the church at Argyle that on Sunday, all of you are encouraged and all of you are equipped. To be encouraged means that you are inspired, that you are strengthened, that you are restored, that you are energized. To be equipped means that you're ready, you're prepared, you're developed, you're built up. The Argyle Summit that we're having in a couple of weeks is designed to encourage and to equip you. A healthy church will be encouraged and a healthy church will be equipped. We saw last week that all of that begins with leadership. Everything rises or falls on leadership. And that's why the Apostle Paul said this in verse 12. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, we ask you, Christians, to give recognition to those who labor among you and lead you in the Lord and admonish you and to regard them very highly in love because of their work. In other words, Paul is encouraging the church to love and to honor and to respect their leaders. You see, that's what a healthy church does. But an un unhealthy church will have constant conflict between the pastor and the people. It's an unhealthy relationship that begins, that sounds like this. It's us against him. The church against the pastor and there are churches who struggle with this. Now we know that no pastor is perfect, especially this one. Just like no church member is perfect. So what is required of the people and what is required of the pastors is respect and honor and love for each other. Some of y'all use the devotional book, Our Daily Bread. It's excellent. And there was an article titled, How to Get Rid of Your Pastor. Now, you want to take notes on this one. <laughs> this is important. Apparently, there were a group of people who approached another pastor for some advice on how they could get rid of their pastor. But that pastor saw through their request and offered this wise counsel on how they could get rid of their pastor. Look your pastor straight in the eye, and while he's preaching, say amen once in a while. If you do that, he will preach himself to death, and you will be rid of your pastor. Amen. <laughs> now, if that doesn't work, then try this. Pat him on the back. Tell him his good points. And if you do, he will work himself to death. And then you will be rid of your pastor. Now, if that doesn't work, try this. Rededicate your life to Christ. And then ask your pastor for a job to do in the church. And if you do that, he will die of shock. <laughs> and you'll be rid of your pastor. If that doesn't work, then try this. 
get all of the church to pray for your pastor. And if you do, he will become so effective that a bigger and better church will take him away from you. (laughs) And then you'll finally be rid of your pastor. I'm so thankful that Argyle is a church that prays for your pastor. I know that because you tell me. You pray for your pastor because you are a healthy church. And I'm so thankful that I feel respected and honored and loved most of the time. And not because I deserve it, but because you are a healthy church. And I thank God for you. And then Paul changes his focus from the church's relationship with leadership to what we can do to help with problems in the church. Since no church is perfect, not even a healthy church, we must learn how to deal with people problems. To pretend that problem people are not in the church will not make them go away. The biggest threat to the health of the church does not come from without. The biggest threat to the health of the church does not come from the world. It does not come from Satan. Instead, the biggest threat to the health of the church comes from within. And if not dealt with properly, it will have a a negative impact on the health and the ministry of the church. So Paul gives us three kinds of people in the church who need our help. Number one, the idle. Number two, the discouraged. Number three, the weak. And then Paul gives us three ways that we can help them. Number one, be patient. Number two, don't repay evil for evil. Number three, pursue what is good for all. Three kinds of people in the church who need our help. Number one, the idol. Verse 14. And we exhort you, brothers and sisters. So who's Paul talking to? Brothers and sisters. He's talking to Christians. He's talking to believers. He's talking to Christ followers. He's talking to members of the family of God. Brothers and sisters. If you grew up in church, there's a good chance you were were taught to call each other brother and sister. There's some who call me Brother Rick. Brother Donna, Sister Donna, (laughs) verse 14. And we exhort you, brothers and sisters. We see that this is very important to Paul because he used the word exhort. Exhort has a sense of urgency. Exhort means to urge. Verse 14, we exhort you. In other words, we urge you, brothers and sisters. We urge you to do what? To warn those who are idle. To be idle means to be apathetic. To be idle means you just don't really care. The word for idle means to be careless and to be out of line. That word would be used to describe a soldier who was out of rank and insisted on marching his own way. The word idol can also be translated as unruly. To be idle means to be unruly, means to be rebellious, means you refuse to follow the rules. You know, some people love rules. Their attitude is just tell me what to do and I'll do it. That way you know what's expected. But an overemphasis on rules will put us into bondage. That's true. Without rules and without standards in the church, there will be chaos. You know, Argyle is described many times as laid back. And some make the mistake that laid back means there are no rules. That we can live our life however we choose. That living without rules and standards is a sign that you are mature and that you are free to do whatever you wish. But that kind of attitude 
will not produce a healthy church because we need guidelines. We all need guardrails because God calls us to a higher standard. The idle, the unruly are those who are out of step with the mission and the vision of their church. And so they choose not to serve. Just show up on Sunday and do nothing else. They choose not to be a generous giver. They choose not to support the leadership of the church. And it might be that they just don't care. Or it could be that they're upset about something. You know, sometimes people will move your cheese. But if that attitude is not dealt with, the attitude of the idol will become hard and bitter. Three kinds of people in the church who need our help. The idol. Number two, the discouraged. Verse 14. And we exhort you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle, comfort the discouraged. Notice that we are to warn the idle, but we are to comfort the discouraged. The word discouraged means to have a small soul. These are the people who tend to quit or who always want to quit because they are discouraged. They see the glass half empty. They see the dark side of things. They tend to be pessimists. I thank God for those in the church who have boldness and who have courage. They're not afraid. They fear not. Nothing is impossible. And then there are the discouraged. And they lack boldness. And they lack faith. And they say, we cannot do that because we don't have the money. And they fear change. And they're afraid of anything new. And it seems like they're always worried about something. They think that the church's ministry needs to be safe. That the church's ministry needs to be secure. So those who are strong in the faith need to comfort the discouraged and bring them along to a daring faith. The Greek word for comfort is actually made up of two words, near and speech. The idea is, instead of hollering and yelling at the discouraged and tell them to get with it, we are to come close to come near, to come alongside of the discouraged and gently speak comfort to them. We are to teach them how God uses the trials of life to help us to grow in our faith. That challenges and hard times are actually meant to help us to become stronger. Three kinds of people in the church who need our help. The idol the discouraged, the weak. Verse 14, And we exhort you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle, comfort the discouraged, help the weak. In other words, we should warn the idle. We should comfort the discouraged. We should help the weak. The word help means to hold fast. The word help means to To hold on tightly. We are to hold on to the weak and help them not to fall. Now Paul's not talking about those who are physically weak. He's talking to, he's referring to those who are weak in their faith with God. You see, weak Christians have a fragile faith. They tend to have many doubts. They are easily tempted by sin. Weak Christians are those who are afraid of the freedom that they have in Jesus. And because of that fear, they want to live by ridiculous rules and regulations. But Jesus wants us to know the truth. Because the truth will always set us free. Warn the idle. 
comfort the discouraged, help the weak. And then Paul gives us three ways that we can help these people. Number one, be patient. Verse 14, be patient with everyone. You know in the Greek, everyone means everyone. And if we're going to warn the idle, if we are going to comfort the discouraged, if we're going to help the weak, then we must develop patience. See, most of us are not naturally patient, are we? Patience requires a work of God in our life. When everything is going great, then it's not so hard to be patient. But let everything start falling apart, and we soon run out of patience with everything. We usually think of patience as something that is passive, but all through the scriptures, patience is active. Hebrews tells us to run with patience the race that is set before us. You see, patience is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. And we must allow God time to develop patience in our heart while we warn the idle while we comfort the discouraged, and while we help the weak. Be patient. Number two, don't repay evil for evil. Verse 15, see to it that no one repays evil for evil to anyone. Now this is referring to getting revenge. And to not get revenge goes against our natural instincts when someone does us wrong then we have to find some way to pay them back but the one who taught us to love our enemies actually practiced what he preached on the cross Jesus prayed father forgive them be patient don't repay evil for evil. Number three, pursue what is good for all. Verse 15, but always pursue what is good for one another and for all. Don't get revenge. Don't try to even the score. Instead, Hebrews 10, 24, let us think about each other and help each other and show love and do good deeds. Romans 12, verse 20. But you should do this. If your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. Doing this will be like putting burning coals on his head. Do not let evil defeat you, but defeat evil by doing good. May we warn the idle. May we comfort the discouraged. May we help the weak. And by God's grace and by, by God's mercy, may Argyle be a healthy church. You know, I'm so thankful. Last Sunday, several of you responded to the invitation. You accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior. And you confirmed that you are ready to meet your maker. And that's what we want for each of you here today. That you are ready today to meet God. So let me encourage you. If you made a decision for Christ. Tell somebody. Tell somebody so that they can rejoice with you. Tell somebody so that they can pray for you. And then your next step is to be baptized. Even if you've been baptized before. Baptism is our first step of obedience after we trust in Jesus. Baptism is our public declaration that we are following Jesus. So please talk with one of us today. And we'd be glad to schedule your baptism. God bless you.